were looking at um, manifold of ground states on some kind of a symmetry breaking system, and we saw this could be a nice, uh, rich space, and it could have some interesting topology. So we looked at um, pi zero of m. This is whether it's connected or not, and this gave us the main walls. <laughs> Then we were um, looking at simply connected properties of them. So this is measured by um, looking at paths. In the case pi one of them, I'll say more about this last time I was talking with students about this. Um, measures. The idea is the following. Now we look, not whether we can just get from one place to every other place on the manifold, that's whether it's connected, but we look at one map, say f of zero, and some other map, well say f, some path in the surface, and then some other path, g, and we ask if we can continuously deform f to g. So we move it around, just doing these continuous operations. And if we can do that, and so if f is uh, continuously deformable to g, uh, we, take, we take them as the same. Okay? Now, so, so this is more formally in this setup, we say they are homotopic. So what we're going to do is to construct equivalence classes of these parts in the surface. The way we do that technically is add some parameter to the system, like you manipulate for Mathematica, and we, we take it between 0 and 1, so we have t in the interval 0 to 1. We construct a one parameter sequence of maps, and f of 0 is f, and f of 1 is g. And if we can do that, then uh, these two paths are in the same equivalence class. Now, this actually gives us some kind of group structure. Um, because, so we were doing this for, or we were doing this in particular for closed maps. And the sort of the most basic example is whether, what I discussed last time, whether you can take this one and deform it into the trivial map that doesn't go anywhere, that's associated with some kind of uniform structure of the system. We, we can make some kind of a, conf of a group law on these equivalence classes, okay? because if we have some loop, gamma 1, and then we have another loop, gamma 2, we can just compose these as maps. So we start here, we go around by gamma 1, and then we go around by gamma 2, and we have another closed loop. And we can even make that as a map from the circle to this space in the space of ground states by doing this twice as fast, and then the other half of the time we do this one. So this also gives us some kind of group structure on this space of closed loops on the ground state manifold. So that's what this first homotopy group, that's what this pi 1 actually is. So let's review the example we had and let's give more examples. So when M, the case for ferromagnetism, polar order in three dimensions, M was just 
S2, and this is contractible. You know, that, that's the fact that you cannot, this is just trivial, you cannot lasso surface of a, a basketball. All loops contractible down to a point, no obstructions, no, none of these line defects we get for pile on. For the liquid crystal case, we have M of S2 with antipodal points identified. So I showed you this basic kind of non contractible loop. Pick your base point at the north pole and take a big loop that goes all the way around to the south pole, which is the same point as the north pole because of this inversion identification for the space of orientations that you need to describe the liquid crystal. If I do this, this one's not contractible down to the trivial loop, but if I go down and back up, then I can pull it off. As I start at the North Pole and end at the North Pole, I can smoothly pull that off and then deform to the identity. So this non-trivial element, in this case, squares to 1. So you have minus 1 squared is 1. So this pi 1, so this, this space was R P2, or this one, another name for this, is actually just Z2. So there's the two elements. One is the identity, and another one, non-trivial one, minus one. So that was the answer to Urosh's um, clicker question, how many non-trivial defects there are. If you counted the, the trivial one, you know, the identity, you'd have two. The non-trivial one is this minus one here, and it squares to, to 1, so it's just, just minus 1. And this is the group structure, simple discrete. There's, um, <coughs> there's a mathematical way of proving this which, for which you need more mathematics, but it turns out if you have a coset space like this, something mod something else, then if if the top one here is contractible, simply connected, which we already saw, then this becomes just pi zero of the bottom one. So this is just pi zero of Z2. Z2 has two disconnected components, so this is just Z2 itself. So there's a more mathematical proof. The pi one of G mod H is pi zero of H. If G is simply connected. So we can use that to get a formal proof, but we, we showed it here. So there's a, some non trivial class of uh, defects which we saw one time plus one half, look like that with a defect here, continued into three dimensions. And you also showed how you could deform the plus one half into the minus one half. And uh, the integer defects are topologically trivial. If you can escape them to the third dimension, you can eliminate them altogether and deform to the identity. And we'll see something different in two dimensions in a minute. Now let's give some um, other examples. And uh, then look at the counting of the strengths of these um, defects a little bit more carefully, although we've used it quite a few times uh, in these um, series of lectures uh, up, up to up to now. So a, a, an even simpler example is if you just have a, a U1 symmetry group. So that's just the phases on a circle, rotations around the circle. So that the symmetry is just the associated space is just a circle, and you you break it completely. So this is just the S one. This occurs, for example, in superfluidity. Superfluidity is described by some order parameter. It has a magnitude and it has a phase. Magnitude is the strength 
of the symmetry breaking. And theta is an arbitrary phase, the gradient gives superfluid velocity, and so on. So every so you have a circle, every point angle theta on that circle is a different ground state. Arbitrarily chosen when we break the symmetry. So now we can look at uh, textures. So we have, say, uniform phase everywhere. And we can have textures with the phase varies. And we can ask, is there anything topologically non-trivial in there? So we have, in this case, so M is just S1. So we have, we're looking at pi 1, we're looking at maps from the circle to the circle. So it's pretty clear in this case, you can have a map which comes up here, F, back in the circle to the circle, comes up, comes down, goes around like that and so on. You can just pull that back to the identity map. That would be one continuously deformable to the identity. So that and the identity map with no the uniform phase would be in the same equivalence class. The analog of this class here in the liquid crystal case is pretty clear. You go here, you come around, you can go arbitrarily close to here and back and so on. That's deformable. But if you go start here and go right around and wind back to this point. So you have a hoop and you have your elastic band and you wrap it around. That cannot be continuously deformed back to the identity without cutting it and pulling it back. Breaking here, which is not in the topological class, it's not continuous in what we consider. So you have a winding. winding number, and it's very easy to compute. But the winding number is just the integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta dF by d theta, where f is your mac here, yeah? so it's just f of 2 pi minus f of 0. This is a little bit like Robin's case of the Struber's location, you go around once, but instead of this case, instead of going in a spiral sitting up, you just come and you project all of those points down onto one, and you do loops around once, twice, or this way. So, in this case, uh, this pi, pi one, in this case, is just C, the group of integers. You go around n times, and then go around n times, that winds n plus m times. But just the, the group is the space of integers. So this is a winding number. This occurs, so this occurs in superfluidity. It occurs in more complicated form in uh, superconductivity where you also have uh, gauge fields. <coughs> But this is the basic case. It occurs in models of particle physics. So this, this gives um, line defects, the way we've been, this, we, we've been discussing. So if you have some U1 group that's broken in a particle physics model, this occurs in, typically in the early universe. This gives a line defect just identical in structure to these disclination loops that we've been talking about here except for integer winding number. So these are called cosmic strings. So you have some structure like this. It occurs something like 10 to the minus 37 seconds after the Big Bang, typically. This is a, um, some kind of grand unified theory. So we have one, so there's like temperature like 10 to the 28 Kelvin. That mass per unit length of like 10 to the 19 kilograms per centimeter. So one centimeter of cosmic string weighs as much as the Rocky Mountains. And the width is 10 to the minus 15 of an atomic nucleus, and you can wind them all up into the size of a 
smaller than the size of an ant. Uh, so this, uh, and this, this, this was an interesting to cosmologists because so what happens at the core of the defect, as we've been discussing, the order parameter goes to zero. So for um, for the superfluid case, it's superfluid outside and normal inside. For the cosmic string case, it's inside. You have some piece of high temperature phase. So you're not in the ground state here. There's energy density inside all this core. That can gravitate. So that can cause gravitational pumping. So the cosmologists were interested in this. The idea is you start with something hot and uniform at the beginning of the universe, but as it cools down and goes through phase transition, you could produce structures like this, and they could seed gravitational structure. Basic idea is one cosmic string will produce one galaxy. And so you could, uh, you could generate large-scale structure from uniform initial conditions. Mark, did you say yeah. what? What's the core radius of the cosmic string? It's, it's 10 to the minus 27 centimeters. <laughs> so what we're having on the scale of symmetry, it's all determined by the scale of symmetry rate. So this I'm saying is occurring um, just below the Planck scale. So, scale. So if one of those should pass right by here, that would be bad news for us. Too bad news if you get near this core, yeah. You have to get close to large distances of things as well. Okay, um, so let's. Um, I'm going to start the um, Let's look at. Whoops. Well, I'm not using that. Okay. Remember to put it back. Let's see where we can get this same example. Um, from our condensed matter models. So let's look at planar systems. And then I'll go to curves space. So two dimensional systems. So let's do the magnetism case again. And now we have spins, magnetized system, but in the plane. So we point in some direction in the plane. So we start at the origin. Fix the value of the magnetization that gives a direction that's going to intersect. You can mark it by the place it intersects. The circle is the angle theta. So M in this case is S1, just like here. This is just like breaking a U1 symmetry. So pi 1 in this case going to be z again, and you're going to have winding numbers. Now, let's uh, look a little bit more carefully about the pictures you've seen many times, the kind of structures you can get. <coughs> so uniform ground state just be everything magnetized in the same direction. You stick at one point on this circle, basic ground state magnetized. Let's wind around once. So we can have a structure like this. Starts up here, goes here, goes here, here. Does yellow come up? <laughs> Still over here. Let's 
take a structure like this. Let's go in a circle, any circle that encompasses this point. If this is fluid flow, we would call it, what do you call it? Like fluid flow. Source. Source. Right. This is a source. Let's take the loop. Let's choose, I don't know, uh, counterclockwise for this loop. Then we need something with a head on it, as Robin was emphasizing. So let's take this pen. We start here, we follow the sense of the loop. And we follow the magnetization. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. So it winds once, 360 degrees, the same sense as the loop, right? Okay. We call this plus one defect. Does it depend on the sense of the loop? Let's do it this way. What do you get? Oh, I already said it. Okay, do you get plus one or minus one? How many vote for plus one? How many vote for minus one? Got a vote. <laughs> Let's do it again. How many vote for plus one? How many vote for minus one? Okay. Let's look at it. Start here. Goes here, here, here. You reverse the loop, but you also reverse the... I mean, the spins still rotate the same sense as the loop. Right? So it doesn't matter. It's not even a convention. It doesn't matter which orientation you take for the loop, it's just, they all they agree. They agree it's plus one. If they are opposite, you'll get some negative string defect. So, what about, so it doesn't depend on the, uh, the sign of the loop, which is the path of taking through the space. So what about a sink? Okay, good. what's the strength of a sink? How many for plus one? How many for minus one? Good. Okay. This is trickier. You reverse all the signs of the magnetization. But let's go around. Let's choose uh, this one, counterclockwise. You go in here. And then watch the in here, in here, in here, in here, in here. Same or opposite? Same, right? It's the same. So reversing all the spins is a, an inversion, a reversal for the magnetization. It's not for the topological class of the defect. Source and sink are both plus one. This is the sink, everything flowing into you. The defect comes about as you go in towards here. Spins have to rotate 360 degrees and vanish in a small radius. Gradients diverge. You can get around that by making this disordered piece of high temperature paramagnetic phase in the middle. That's your defect. Okay, so the sink is plus one. What about, so, so uh, what's minus one? Now you've seen it a few times. So, 
and why they should be able to draw me a minus one. Because who's brave enough to draw the minus one? Well, I could do it, but you want the students. Yeah, I want yeah. the students. You got, you got one here. Right? Right. Okay, yep, that's good. That's fine. So if we sort of join these up going in here, we continuously, by the way, these things occur in the normalization group flows also, so where the defects are fixed points, so it's also very useful to start to understand a little bit when you study that. So we continuously join this up, here it's going in, here along this line it's going out. So this is the structure, the structure is in on one axis, out on the other. So the mathematicians have a name for this. This is called a cross here. It comes from the sites of a, a gun or what, but it's a oh yeah, probably from bow and arrow, but it's sites. It's a cross here. Two in, two out. It looks really different, right? <coughs> Let's check. So we go around, we take our, take the here, here's our, here's our loop, starts in, and then goes, so we follow this end here, starts in, and then goes up, out. So it's turning around this way, and the loop's going this way, and it's going that way. So that's why this is minus. Quite different symmetry as well. Right? This has this fourfold symmetry. And this is, has this uniform kind of structure. So the de defects of different strength in class um, can look quite different. Now, so we so let's look at the liquid crystal case in the same way. This is two D liquid crystal. So now what we have is the space of lines through the origin in two D. This is our space. Every line through the origin is a, let's do just 2D pneumatic, is a direction, an orientation where you can have a pneumatic border. So, what's M in this case? It's the ground state monopole. Space time. Let's take a fixed magnitude that's going to intersect the circle here and here. Right. So this is S1 mod Z2. So you can write this half of the circle. And then this point is going to be identified with this point. So in this case, quite different. This is pi 1 of this. Now this space up here is not simply connected. So this just picks up all the windings, any winding for the circle is the same here. So this is also the, So it's quite different from three-dimensional cases. This gives... It's a pi 1 defect, but remember we're in two dimensions. So um, it gives a point like singularity. 
So it's a point defect. You can think of it as a cross section through the three dimensional discrimination loop we saw before. So you take cross section through that, so you only have two spatial dimensions, you get a point. But we no longer have this route of escape into the third dimension and so on. So that changes the and group, symmetry group of the defects. So we saw a plus one half case like this, and we saw the minus one half case many times in this week sometimes. So it looks like that. Let's just check. So in this case we don't have a vector, we just have our know, piece of chalk. Um, We'll use this, but remember there's no, there's no head here. And we go around here, this rotates from here to here, to here to here, 180 degrees, not 360. That's coming back to itself on the space because this orientation and this orientation are the same. And it rotates in the opposite sense to the loop. The loop is going around this way, and the orientation is going this way. Opposite. There it's going the same way. 90 degrees, 180 degrees. But this has three folds of it. This has two folds of it. In the case where these defects are active, and flow in the fluid and so on, these two things behave quite differently and have different mobilities and behaviours and so on. So you'll see that in Christina Marchetti's lectures next week. And you can have active pair creation of defects as well as annihilation. You can have like electrons and positrons, and you have a whole field theory of defects, energy consumption and flow. And Spontaneous tear creation. Excuse cool. me, Mark. Yeah. Before you go on, if I could just check to make sure I understand correctly. Right, so you're, you're saying that the, the 2D liquid crystal is quite different from the 3D liquid crystal because the 2D liquid crystal has um, you know, a whole infinite uh, uh, you know, set of possible defects. Yeah. Right? The, the, any half integer or integer charge, yeah. whereas the 3D has only one kind of defect. Topologically speaking, right. Well, topologically speaking, yeah. okay. The one is continuous, so for 3D, a plus one, for example, is con uh, continuously deformable up into a uniform configuration. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the same topological stability. It still has interesting kinetics and energetics and so on. And the negative one half is continuously deformable into the positive. Exactly. Right. And you I showed you that sequence of deformations in one of his slides. Yes. Whereas here it's not. So there isn't anything like the winding number for a 3D liquid crystal. Right, the winding right. Exactly. There's no continuum of expression. It's just whether it's in this non-trivial class or not. The minus one. The only, yes. In the discrete case, no um, winding on Now, um, let's use this, okay? Um, there are two more um, important things I want to say. Let's re relate this to some other things we've been doing this week. So, let's now imagine. A lot of people have been doing this on uh, curved surfaces with the crystal on the sphere, or porous, and so on. Robin was doing it. Um, so, let's relate two things that have come up quite a bit. <clears throat> if we're in the plane, let's look at uh, wind velocities on the surface of the earth, or ocean currents, or something like that. If you have a direction, we have a velocity here. If we're in the plane, we can, there's no problem with having just non-zero velocity field everywhere on the surface of the plane. 
reveal the topologically non-trivial surface like the two sphere, then something different happens. And let's uh, illustrate this with one So let's take the two sphere as the first example. One topological invariant we've seen is the Euler character. Euler and others doing this were originally trying to find classifications of 2D manifold. So they looked at all these possible kinds of surfaces and uh, said, oh, okay, they have so many edges, vertices, faces, and so on, and blah, 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 and they're different if they have this and that and that. But then they found something that didn't change, an invariant. So it sort of doesn't help you classify them, but, well, it doesn't show they're different, it shows they're the same. So the one that Euler, not actually due to Euler, but anyway, are found, uh, can be computed if you have some kind of a polyhedra, which is some triangulation of this surface, a map on this surface, breaking up, think of it as countries now, but living on the two sphere, so like the surface of the Earth. And you look at the number of vertices, you look at the number of edges, you look at the number of faces. If you have a two-dimensional surface, you need two-dimensional structures like faces to build it, but they'll be connected by edges, and they'll have vertices where they meet, intersections. And you take this with alternating signs, so it's V minus V plus F. This is uh, useful because, for example, say so take any map, You have a triangular country, something like that. You can make it more complex or more simple. For example, you can add a node here and then divide like this. On one map, you make another map. In this mapping, you've added one node, you've added three edges, and you've added, you've gone from one face to one, two, three faces, three countries. So this goes up by two. This goes up by 1, and this goes down by 3. So the sum, this goes up by 3. So the change in time is 0. So you can do this with more complicated uh, coarsenings. You can start with a very complicated map and simplify it by removing nodes, swapping if you take if you have something like this, and then go here and you flip it. So the link going here, you make another map on the surface of the Earth. Chi doesn't change. This didn't change faces, vertices, or edges. But it made a different map. So doing this, you can you have an invariant, a topological invariant of the surface, the spoiler characteristic. Uh, one question. Yeah. So is it important if this surface has boundary or not? And what about orientability of this surface? Yes, orientability is important. Boundary you can incorporate. Um, with holes you can incorporate. Counting might be slightly different at the boundaries. So this, all of this is a little bit simpler for the closed case. Orientability is not important for this characterization. It's important if you look, put a spin on the surface or something like that where you need a normal, well-defined. So, so you can do this also for open and manner. Now let's, uh, so we can, knowing this, you can very, you never have to remember the uh, Euler characteristic for the sphere. You can just take the simplest kind of, so you do all these manipulations, take the um, triangulation of the true sphere and reduce it down to the very simplest one. One triangle like that, and then the back face, right? The triangle, and you close the back with one face. That's a very simple triangulation of the two Do you agree? So how many vertices? How many vertices? Three. 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 One, two, three. How many edges? Three. One, two, three. And how many faces? One. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky. So it's not actually one. Because you have the one would just give you a triangle, which does have a boundary. 
So you're closing the back with the other face. So there's two. See that? Two faces. So B minus E plus F is two. So there you go. You don't have to remember. You compute what the characteristic of the two squares in the Now let's do the following thing. So we take a we take a triangulation of the two sphere, and we think of it as uh, so we can continuously do formula. We think of it as some polyhedron. Polyhedron. So we have something like this. Polyhedral representation of the two isosceles and something like that. Now we're going to decorate it with a vector field. So what we're going to do? We're going to make every vertex a source like we had before. So vector fields coming out everywhere from these vertices. And here. And here. And here. And here. 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 We're going to make every face a sink. So the vector field is going to flow in here, sink here. And so every edge, what do we have? Two in, two out. So every edge is across here. Right? So when we do this, we have defects in the vector field. We have places where the vector field must vanish to zero. So, so the strength of the zero of the vector field where we have a defect uh, is called well, the analog of the Wyoming number in this case, or the strength of the defect. It's called an index, just another name. So now, the index of this associated vector field is plus one for every vertex, so we get number of vertices, minus one for every edge where we have a crossing, and plus one for every face where we have a sink. So the total index is equal to the Euler characteristic. So when the Euler characteristic is non-zero, two for the sphere, this means that any vector field on that surface must have a place, at least the total sum of the indices of the zeros of the vector field on that surface is two. There's got to be at least one place where this is zero. So the wind velocity or the ocean current velocity somewhere on the surface of the earth is zero. Now the point. You can actually have just one, which is what we were discussing in Romans lecture. You can have a dipole like this. that structure, you can continuously deform around the surface of the Earth. So it's non-zero everywhere, but at this one point here. So here if you look at the winding number, it's going to wind once around here, and once around here, so it winds twice. The index is two. But typically, um, this will break up into two plus one defects. So let's look at the two-dimensional uh, the method. The, the energy is one half K1, K1 times um, the divergence of N, 
can turn it into if you can't have twists. So it's twist is n dot curl of n. Curl of n is perpendicular to n, and so it just vanishes. So you can have splay, and you can have twist, uh, bend. Bend is n cross curl of n, which is in two dimensions, it's just curl of n. You can check that. So let's take k1 equals k3. This just stands up into the uh, d of n. So we can take n as just cosine phi, sine phi, and then the equation of motion is just the plus n of n is zero. So this just goes to plus n of phi is zero. So we can take phi as linear in some angle of theta plus some constant. So the plus and minus a half defects we were talking about here. So as you go around uh, 2 pi, pi should wind just 180 degrees, so s should be plus or minus a half. <coughs> and then just theta is just tan in this y over x. So you can write explicit solutions in this case, which is what John um, Francois was asking about. This and you can sum them up because it's linear, and you can also compute the energy of the defect. So it's just one half k, and then we have the integral. Uh, we just have to compute the Laplacian of this theta. So the gradient just has a term one over r d theta. Nothing depends on r in this case. So we have uh, integral r dr. And we have this squared, so that's the important thing. The strength comes out squared, s squared. This is linear. We have a 1 over r squared from the derivative. Um, and so uh, we, get, uh, we get 2 pi from the we have integral d. We get 2 pi from that. We get pi a s squared. And the r and both dr over r, so it's logarithmically divergent. So it's cut off by some system size r and some core radius r. So the important thing is this. So now if you have a strength plus one defect, so call pi k times the rest sort of e zero, e of plus one is going to be four times an e of one half because of the s squared. So plus 1 could break something to 2 1 half. If you have something like uh, a defect like this, and then it breaks up into a half here and a half here, the energy will be of 1 half is a quarter of 1. So two of these, the energy is still 1 half, the energy of a single 1. So energetically, the highest strength defects like to break up these be small ones. That's why you usually won't see an energetic case, the single plus two defect on the on the sphere. And finally. Let me show you how um, defects basically inevitably form in quenches. So imagine that we, this is made of a continuous phase transition like superfluidity. We rapidly quench into the ordered phase. So you're going to want to order, you're going to want to form some uniform. Um, superfluid. Let's mark it as, you know, let's call the order parameter phi. In some region, phi is going to be non-zero, you're ordering. But there's going to be a limit on the size over which things can simultaneously order at any given 
kind or point and point. It's marked by correlation lengths, like persistent length, and so on. Range over which the system is ordered. So you're going to have a limit to this size. In cosmology, it's the horizon size. Things that are not causally connected can't communicate, but they can't know they should order in the same direction. So over here, you're going to have another bubble. This is phi 1, and this is phi 2. Another point wants to be ordered, but there are an infinite number of places that can order any point on that ground state manifold M. Right? So this is going to be phi 2. Have another region here. This is going to be phi 3. <coughs> so the idea of, it's actually known in kinesiotic physics, but the idea of Tom Kibble and thinking about this, how many defects can be produced in phase transitions in the early universe, was to say, okay, let's take a random assignment of phi, a different causally disconnected or independent domains outside each other's correlation length, and then just ask that we randomly and, and then discretize it. So we, you, the system forms by coalescing bubbles, sort of a triangulation. So we take three domains like that meeting, and they'll try to uniform up as, as they coalesce to make one big ordered domain. So let's model it in the following way. I'll give you the example of S1, ordered domain displacement, breaking U1, or planar spins, and so on. We will have take this one, since the first one we can choose it when we want, to be this ground state, theta equals zero. The next one is a random point on the circle. So throw a dart, boom, that hits here. This is going to be theta two. Throw another dart, boom, it hits here. This is going to be theta three. If all these points are close, theta zero, so this is theta one, theta zero. If these are all close, it's going to be very easy for these, as these domains coalesce, for them to be uniformized. There's a gradient squared in the energy, so they basically try to continuously interpolate and come together to agree some kind of average, minimizing the gradient. If they're all nearby here, that's easy. If they are far, let's see what's going to happen. For example, if one is over here, that's theta 2, and here's theta 3, theta 1 can go around and connect Theta two. So these two can merge and uniformize by going this way or that way around the circle. They'll go the shortest length because that minimizes the gradient. Because the gradient the angle squared. So from theta one we'll go this way or this way depending on which is closer. So here we'll go here. Then we have to look at whether this angle is pi or not. If it's less than pi we'll go this way. If it's greater than pi it's going to be shorter to backtrack and go around to here. So, if uh, theta 2 minus theta 3 is less than pi, these will join this way, and if theta 3 is greater than pi, theta 3 will join back this way not reverse and back around this way. So these two conditions will guarantee you wind once around as they merge. This is one half of two pi. So the probability of what's happened is one half of this to be true, and one half of this to be true. So it's one, qu one quarter. So one quarter of the time in this mechanism, as they merge, they will produce a defect at the center because you minimize gradients by winding all the way around. So per correlation volume of ZQ, you expect one quarter you expect one quarter of a defect. The number of defects will be one quarter times correlation volume. So
So they're inevitable. This means they will inevitably form. Yeah. No, that's that's just a discretization. So it doesn't mean that. So for an exercise, you can take RP two. Do the same exercise, three random points on RP2, and compute the analog of this one quarter. So the answer is 1 over time. We should try. And finally, before I take questions, I have one topological uh, exercise for you. So it is the, it's the following. So, um, you're going to cross your hands like this. You want to do this? Lace your fingers. Go underneath. Take those two index fingers, touch the two <laughs> and then pull up apart. <laughs> you got it? What, why thumbs? Let's see. I don't know if I did it correctly. Yeah. Do this. Like this. Underneath. Yeah. Index fingers. And that, which which fingers? <laughs> Those two, yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> pull them apart. <laughs> no, you cross down and you're cheating. Did you get it? <laughs> no, you don't have to cross over. <laughs> you just have to change which one you can do the other way around. Yes. yes. So if you if you cross underneath like this, which most right handers will do, is a topological obstruction. If you cross the right one, on the top, you go into the other topologically inequivalent class. <laughs> so this good party trick, even better than balancing spoons on your nose. Right one goes on top? Yes, right one on top. And then the left thumb goes on the bottom, and the right thumb goes on the bottom. Oh, everything's interlaced after that. Don't care about the thumb, actually. So everything's interlaced, only the top one is on top. Still have a back. Wait a minute. Turn, turn over. Let me see your right hand. Right hand on top. Right hand is on top. Yeah. And the top finger, yeah. It's the leading finger. Is that right? The right hand is on top. Right hand on top of the left hand, this finger first. Yeah. Screw this, OK. 
dislocations in many materials are not stable. They break into two mixed dislocations separated by stacking fault. Something similar can happen in this system. What drives that? Is it differences in the crank constant? So 